Let's move forth to the question of, of why, why to curate. Why not just continue writing texts and only doing that, right? One simple reason is because it allows you to put things into space rather than just on paper. And uh, that's something that already is at play when you, when you think of individual works. When you exhibit a, a work like this, which is a purely textual work, something happens which wouldn't happen when it was, which didn't happen when it was in a book. It's actually a, a page taken from a book. Or when you, when you have this, this statement by Stefan Brüggemann, which is not from an exhibition I did myself, um, there's something that happens by the simple fact that he's going to take an exhibition wall, basically, off a contemporary art space for several weeks, and he's going to state that all his ideas are imported, all his products are exported, and that all his explanations are rubbish. Sort of a self-depreciatory statement, for which he, however, takes, paradoxically, a whole wall, right? It's very different than just typing that up on your computer, because there are different r relationships of, of, of course, money, of power, of what could have done with this space if he hadn't put it there, and so on, at play. But to go back to, uh, to this work, um, what happens when it's in a space? That's the, that's the actual text. Well, I think it, it, can, make you, it can make you move uh, closer. Actually, when pe people start looking at it, um, they first have this apprehension and then they move and they have this bodily this need of going forward and then discovering, discovering the detail and it somehow particip participates in the, in, the, in the meaning of the work. That's what you see when you get close. And I'll, I'll come back to that um, in a minute. Another reason that's interesting uh, from putting things into space is because you know where people are where they come from and what they've seen before. When I write something in a book, I don't know, or in a blog, I don't know if people will read it in the metro, on their, on their iPhone, or whether they'll read it on a computer at home, whether they, they'll sit in a park. So I don't have control of the space where they're in. And so I can't work with that space, actually. Right? I can't really work with the environment. Uh, in an exhibition, I, I can do that. I can have a, a floor map and can be like, OK, they'll come in here, and, and the first thing they'll, they'll notice is, is this pretty much in the middle, there are two ways to go into the exhibition. And in many cases of, of sort of classical exhibitions, you'll find this kind of signs in France, right? Which actually means the direction of the visit as it is translated here. And in one of the, actually the first exhibition I sort of was part of, I used that, I put a sign that said Sens de la Visite, direction of the visit, I put it on this post that you just saw. But of course, the, the arrow was absent. And, and sauce has this double meaning. I think in Spanish, sentido mm -hmm. es igual, no? Yes. It, has, it has the meaning of direction, but also of, of meaning. And, and so people stood there, and, and basically they had, they had to decide where to go in a very basic way, right? What direction? What's the direction of the visit? And um, when you look up on, on Google what sens de la visite means, they give you the, the signification of meaning of the visit, but of course in an exhibition space that's not what you expect. What you will read first, because of the context, and words, as you probably know, have meaning in context. Sens means something different in an exhibition space than when I tell you le sens de cette phrase, when I speak about the, the sens de, of a sentence. They, they, weren't, they weren't quite conscious of, of that, of that uh, signification, and in the best cases, Actually, when I, when I did that, uh, a doctor came to see me who had visited the exhibition and he said, ah, did you do that work? It's really interesting because first I just entered and I was like, okay, they forgot the error. And I was walking through the space and eventually I was listening to a piece and they were talking about the sens, the meaning of things. And I was like, oh, actually that's what it's about. So it's, the idea was sort of to redistribute the power to the, you know, to the person who has to give the meaning of their visit. And, and to ask this question, what's the meaning of you? Is why you're going, why you're going to see the space? What, what does it mean for you? So, to 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 take away the word from its practical use and put it back into its metaphysical, its metaphysical sense. And the big hope, for me at least, is that when people leave the exhibition and then they go to the Louvre and they see that, that they also have this little trouble, you know, that they remember that they have a memory of this little trouble before. And it goes with them, and they're like, yeah, maybe actually here, why do I come in? Is it for social reasons? Is it, why, why do we go to, to these kind of spaces? 
So um, this is based on the fact that a place to exhibit art is no neutral space. It is tied to certain expectations about what, what you're going to find there. It's also uh, tied to social norms, what you're allowed to do, and typical behaviors of how you behave, how you look at stuff, and so on and so forth. And I think you can do more with this than just put stuff on the wall or on the floor. You can try to challenge these expectations rather than just using the walls you have you know, to, to, to align stuff, basically. An exhibition space also fosters a different kind of attention than, uh, than a simple text, text would do when you come into, into, this, uh, into this space. This was the same exhibition uh, with this waiting room. You look at these things in a, in a sort of, of different manner than you would uh, in, a, in another space. When you see that, well, what will happen? People will basically, basically do that and go, go near. People are physically present. And the physical movement can and should be organized by you. I think that's an interesting way, way to think about it. How am I going to organize the physical movement of people? The things I put up, you could see them as devices to organize what people will maybe think, what ideas they have, and also how they move through the space. So uh, something to organize their experience. This, what, what interested me in that, this was actually an index of a book called De la Représentation, about representation by Louis Marin, a French uh, theorist. And this is the index that had been established by someone probably after he died, because the book was published after, after he died. And one, uh, one notion here is different from the others. You see that all notions give the, the pages. But this one says, invisible, voire visible. So it sends you to another notion in the index. And basically, it means invisible, see visible. Of course, it's supposed to be only a sort of indication of where you have to look if you're interested in the notion of invisibility in Louis Marin's work. But here, I think, once it is put in this context, it starts to make sense. If you want to see the invisible, look at the visible. Rather than sending you towards the sense that would be in the pages of the book, which an index normally does, it, it really makes sense in this, sense, in this, uh, in this context. Uh, in an exhibition, visual appearance and materiality are also salient, as opposed to, you know, if you read a pocketbook of Shakespeare, or you read, a, in France it would be La Pléiade collection, very high-end collection, um, you, uh, that's not really salient for the text, because as Nelson Goodman says, uh, these are allographic works, whereas, whereas we're used to artworks to be autographic works where it plays a role in what materials they are made and so on. So even when you have this, uh, this book in a bag, this book simply put in a bag, in an art space, and it says promise, promise, um, it, can, it can acquire a metaphorical meaning that it, it wouldn't have when you carried it around in the street. Because people have this disposition to look and to have this refined perception. And maybe again, here the hope would be that Maybe in the street, they also sometimes have a little, a little change of perception once they leave the actual exhibition space. So if all goes well, I would say people will leave your show with different eyes than those they came with. And I think it's important that we try to nurture connections with ordinary experience, that we, that we know that people most of the time have ordinary experiences, and then we try to to find, give them ways to, to connect what we offer them with, with the more ordinary experiences they have, so they can see this bag differently um, afterwards. I don't know. Yeah. Um, now for a solo show uh, with Benjamin Igar, useful abstraction. It shouldn't say 2015, should it? 2016. <laughs> it's last time, sorry about that. Useful abstraction. Um, where I, where I think we tried to put into place this idea of a script, of the, that, a, that an exhibition is somehow like a movie, you know, where just you are actually given the time as, as you walk through it, rather than, than being controlled totally by the medium, like you are in a movie. If you look away, the movie runs on, you don't see it. But there is something similar, like a movie, and you can have a, a script for it. And this was a solo show. When you do a solo show, I guess at least when the artists are young and they don't have five solo shows at the same time, you usually become a co-curator, I guess, because the artist is, of course, um, also, also curating his show. And it's one of the interesting elements uh, 
of it to discuss with them. And so I think that an exhibition is not only an argument, but can also be a narrative, complete with suspense, what is that, curiosity, uh, curiosity and uh, surprising changes in the story. I think it's at least an interesting way to, to approach it and to try to write a script about the show. This show by Benjamin was pretty simple. When you came in, it looked like that. Um, and when you looked the other way, it looked like that. It looked very classical, two sort of abstract paintings on, on each end, big abstract paintings, and then these very figurative um, portraits, actually self-portraits of, of Chinese. What are the elements of this, of this exhibition? What are the parts of it? Okay, there's something on the benches, yes. So then you have these, of course, these are the obvious elements, and then you have that. And what else? Lighting. The lighting, yeah, indeed. Okay, yeah, that's the sort of the structure. And of course, the benches themselves as well, mm -hmm. right? You, you would usually perceive them just as mobilier. But of course, this mobilier does something as well because it allows you to, to sit down and then maybe invites you to contemplate that, like you would contemplate a, a paysage in the Louvre, you know, where you have where you have a ben bench in front of a of a landscape painting. And uh, so it invites for 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 the kind of engagement where you can also sit down and maybe a contemplative attitude. Now, when you get closer, you realize that these are a very that these are not photos. Maybe first. People, some people also thought they were photos, that they're just photorealistic paintings. And uh, when you get into the narrative, you take the, the page, um, the information page, uh, and you start reading it, it you, you realize that what looked so classical is actually much less classical as it, as it seemed, because, than it seemed, because these are self-portraits made by painters in China that work in these kind of factories where you can send your photo and they'll paint it for you. I don't know if you know about that, but you can basically send anything and you can say, I want hand-painted Van Gogh uh, flowers and then someone will do that in China. They're probably not allowed to sign it with Van Gogh, but apart from that, it will look the same. And, uh, and the Montmartre pictures in Paris that are sold in the boutiques, many of them are now produced in China by people who never went to Montmartre and who just take a photo of it and paint it. Then they sell it in Paris as if it was painted by a Montmartre painter. And artists have started using these uh, these Chinese workers, basically, because it's more work than, than art, uh, for their own purpose. But Benjamin Hugard, who did the exhibition, realized that they were never visible. That the artists reproduced the same thing, that uh, reproduced this idea of, of China being the factory of the world or something like that, where, where you can produce all kinds of, of stuff, like my computer, but now you can also produce art. How cool is that? And so he said, how could I make them visible? And he found a very dis a simple device, which was to say, I'll just order a self-portrait. I'll, I'll pay them so they paint themselves. And so he went there, and it was not so obvious, because while there's a big tradition of portraiture in, in Chinese painting, there's no big tradition of auto-portraiture, as far as I know. It's not as, uh, and so it seems obvious to us when we're trained with the Renaissance that there's auto-portraiture, but so for, these, for many of the painters, it didn't make sense. Why would they paint themselves? So he had to sort of talk to them, and some of them accepted, and so there was this whole part of the negotiation, and in the end, he had this series of self-portraits um, where they chose pretty much how they wanted to be represented. And in some of them, you still see that it used to be a photo because you have the flesh here, the, the reflection of the flesh. Uh, in one of the images, you have a sort of selfie hand because basically they paint, painted after photo. And, uh, and this thing was put in relationship with, with these big abstract landscapes, which were actually, which looked like that, which were actually not really abstract landscapes, but backgrounds for photography. Because before you had Photoshop, people used to use these things, graded backgrounds, uh, to, to make photo shoots, put a product on it and it looked nice, you didn't have to do this with the lighting, you just, uh, you just used, uh, used these backgrounds. And most of the companies who did that are, 
are dead now. They, 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 they went bankrupt or they do something else because no one needs them. But there's still one uh, in Taiwan which still produces them. And it's actually um, uh, serigraphy, uh, what, what uh, Warhol used as well in the factory. What's the, the process? Silk screen. So it's actually a silk screen technique with which they make it. So they're all a little different and they're not completely the same. And, and Benjamin pretty much ordered two of these uh, backgrounds and put them together. Instead of cutting it, he put them together and then you have this little, this little movement which shows that this abstract form actually is a very personal form which was made by hand by someone. Um, and also it's a reflection of course on the end of, of the analog photography and, uh, and the, the replacement of it by digital. Um, one thing I, within this context seems important to me is that we don't think of the spectator only as viewers, disembodied eyes, but also as visitors, maybe even guests, with a body, that's why you can provide benches, uh, you should also, I think, guide them, but also prepare opportunities for discovery and deeper engagement. I don't know why that happened. Um, also prepare opportunities for discovery and deeper engagement. So I think the deeper engagement should be made rewarding. There should be a way for those people that go into exhibitions, or maybe not, that go like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, thank you, bye. Okay. Maybe there should be something in for them, even though I'm not sure. Maybe we don't have to even care about these, these people. But um, at least we should, we should provide uh, something for those that are willing to, to engage more deeply in details. I mean, this is, this is not part of my curation, Benjamin's work, but when you look closely, you see that it sort of comes up and you can sort of reconstruct the context of that thing. You can sort of figure out that it was rolled, that it was sent from somewhere in a rolled format and so on. So, so if you want to engage, you can.